So with that, we are going to move to our next fabulous speaker. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce John Lacey. John Lacey is a system strategist in the Department of Communications and Marketing at the University of Tennessee System. In his current role, John is the lead on a statewide initiative called the Grand Challenges. And his efforts are directed towards addressing really critical areas that are affecting the state of Tennessee. So it's a big job for sure. What this includes is engaging university and community stakeholders to identify and facilitate opportunities for collaboration um, in hopes of creating mechanisms to promote cross-networking and relationships and also amplifying the work and research of university faculty who are engaged in trying to work on these grand challenges. He is also a member of our 2023 Advanced Certification Cohort at Career Research Lab. And without knowing it, he's also probably going to be one of our first guests at our ThinkX podcast series, which starts next month. But now you know, John. Great. <laughs> So we've had the privilege of working with John for the last couple of years. I will tell you, it has been an absolute pleasure as he is not only all of the things I just mentioned, he's also a really, really good human who's working very hard to make this planet a better place. So without delay, I'm gonna hand it over to you, John. Oh, thank you. That's really a great introduction. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, are we good on the screen? Everybody seeing the slides? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, well, let's get rolling here. So before we jump into it, I just want to take a quick second and recognize the names on this screen. These are folks that have influenced and contributed substantially to all the good things I'm going to share today and none of the bad things I'll share today. So I really appreciate all these folks that, that you're seeing here. <clears throat> okay, so moving along here. Now what? This is a, a short and weighty question that really translates to, I don't know what to do next or where to go from here. And these now what's can pop up all the time, like when you're on your way to the gas station to fill up your tank and you realize you left your wallet at home or when your kids start driving and suddenly your schedule doesn't have things like soccer practice on it. Or when you go to the barbershop and you ask for just, you know, a slight trim off the top and you end up with a buzz cut. <clears throat> so I'm sure most of you and likely all of you have at one time or another asked yourself a now what question when you've been faced with a murky, foggy, or ill-defined assignment. And you might be a little unsure of where to start or even a little, little fearful of making the wrong decisions or taking the wrong steps. And all these thoughts can really leave you feeling a little frozen, right? So I just want to pause here for a sec and give you all just a, a few seconds to Jot down a current assignment or an obstacle that you're facing that is uh, producing that maybe that a little bit of that frozen feeling for you on what to do next. So just a few seconds here. Okay, hopefully everybody's in good shape there. And I'm sure most people had something that came to mind. And for those of you that did not, congratulations, you are crushing it in life. Uh, keep, keep doing what you're doing. But for the rest of us, I feel like this raises a question. So how can you begin to take some steps forward and really get clarity around these obstacles? Well, it's no surprise that there is a hero you can lean on, and that hero is systems thinking. And so what I want to talk to you, talk to you all about today is how I've used systems thinking to think through challenges that can be difficult to get started and difficult to navigate. And really, my big goal here is that by the end of this talk, you'll have more confidence to deal with those types of challenges and maybe some new or a refresher of some systems thinking principles that you can apply to whatever's next for you. And so these principles include the importance of structure for relationships, understanding problems before jumping to solutions, and mapping to gain clarity, enhance your thinking and communications. And perhaps for those of you currently experiencing that frozen feeling, you can take a little comfort in knowing that it's okay to be unsure of what to do next, uh, but there is a way forward using systems thinking to help thaw that ice. So I'm going to share with you a bit of my own story and situation to help bring these principles to life. And uh, to pull back the curtain a little bit here, it's been a, it's been a pretty thorny process. Nothing has been straightforward. 
I find myself implementing new knowledge around systems thinking as I go. So fair warning to all you experts out there. You are probably well advanced of where I am, and, and that's great. Uh, but if you decide to hang on with us, I'll, I'll jump in and kind of give you my backstory here. <clears throat> so back in 2021, our university system leadership revised our organization's five-year strategic plan. One of the big goals of that plan was to identify three major problems affecting communities across the state of Tennessee. So the idea or the vision was to transform these problems into strengths over the next decade by generating some system-wide and statewide collaboration. So this would involve focusing, connecting some historically siloed university resources and expertise. <clears throat> and to figure out what these critical areas would be, we, we really leaned on our own faculty and experts and uh, performed two statewide surveys asking residents, you know, what, what are the concerns that are on your mind? What's weighing you down these days? And then we cross-referenced those identified areas with where the university had strengths, where we already had some expertise and experience across our five campuses and two institutes and our network of agents in all 95 counties across Tennessee. And we landed on tackling uh, three issues, these three issues, strengthening rural communities, overcoming addiction, and advancing K through 12 public education. So rural communities, if you don't know much about them, ones in Tennessee at least, can have immense struggles in economic development, job access, labor force access, healthcare access, transportation, childcare availability, and many other disparities. <clears throat> and likewise, many communities in Tennessee, especially in our Eastern Appalachian areas, have experienced the devastating effects of opioid addiction and all the related problems that go hand in hand with that, like crime and violence, overdose deaths, labor force depletion, mental health challenges, and many other crippling issues. K through 12 education is affected by both these challenges. Again, in our, in our more rural areas, we're seeing things like teacher shortages, limited opportunities for a career uh, exposure and career pathways for students, lower college going rates. And for those families that are struggling with addiction problems, those challenges just expand exponentially, as you might imagine. So we've come to call these issues collectively the grand challenges. They're large, very complex, quite difficult to solve, as you might imagine. And the only way to truly transform these issues into strengths would involve some very purposeful collaboration across our state. <clears throat> so we've identified these three critical areas, right? Now what? We're faced with this familiar question, and we're still facing this question in many ways. <laughs> now what do we need to do? What does tackling these colossal problems even look like? How do we begin to start this? And how do we support collaboration? So it was, this, it was this great dream, right? Handed down to us, but we were really unsure of what to do with it and even who was going to lead it. So part of answering that now what question became about structure. You see, uh, we have lots of folks across our university that are engaged in this research and work in all these different areas, but we didn't at the time have any sort of centralized structure dedicated to the initiative. There was no unit or individual whose focus would be on making sure that this initiative is brought to life, right? So I think this in large organizations like ours, I think this can be pretty common. At the top, you've got the visionaries, the folks that establish the vision, where they want the organization to be and what they want it to be. And with that, there's, there's often not a crystal clear blueprint that goes along with it and how it's gonna be brought to life. And so it becomes the responsibility of folks implementing the vision to kind of define how that work will be achieved. So lucky for me, this was around the same time that I started investing in learning systems thinking through the Cabrera Research Lab, where you learn a lot about the importance of giving relationships that intentional structure. And this is one of their illustrations that just really helped me. Uh, so I hope I'm gonna do it justice here. But imagine if you, you need to hire a plumber to hook up your sink, right? You don't want to hire the plumber that shows up with the marker and merely draws the blue line connecting your sink to the wall. And then a week later sends you the invoice, right? That doesn't do anybody good. 
you need real tangible structure to handle that water inflow and outflow. You need to hire the plumber who's going to use some kind of pipe or water line to connect your sink to that household water system. And so, oh, you guys still there? This was kind of our situation. We had this sink of an idea, um, this great initiative that was intended to bring a lot of good to our state. But at this point, it was only alive in spirit and, and just on paper. It was like that blue line connecting our campuses, but nothing really there. We needed some intentional relationship structure to bring it to life. We needed that pipe. And so this is really where I've spent the majority of my time uh, trying to figure out where and how we can link our faculty and departments, campuses and communities across Tennessee to generate that collaboration around these challenges. And also, how can we make our university experts and resources more accessible to our communities in need? <clears throat> so a big part of my role is, is being that link and looking for and creating those opportunities to connect people to engage in that problem solving together. And for example, in the coming months, I'll be working with a colleague to connect people across our university system and state around rural disability resources. That's something that I normally just have stayed at a campus or a local level, but uh, with this initiative, it's being raised, elevated up to that statewide system level. And so this brings us to our first key principle. Establishing structure and relationships is a really great systems thinking principle to put into practice. When you want a relationship to function well or exist beyond paper, you have to be very intentional about putting something there, some kind of accountability to bring it to life. The relationship between two things, two or more things could be a business unit, could be an individual or metrics or some other thing, anything that helps you assign accountability. And you can't really expect a relationship to function without structure, just like marriage or parenting or collaboration or international relations, whatever it is, you've got to have something in place that makes the relationship real and makes it work. <clears throat> Another foundational principle that was really key for me and should be for any project really is that you can't really begin to solve problems until you understand them. You need to lift the hood, investigate, understand the system, identify those parts, holes, relationships, pers perspectives, all those variables that are contributing to the emergent outcomes. So some full measured appropriate vulnerability here. Uh, this is something that I have to relearn over and over again. Uh, like probably many of us out in out in cyberspace right now, <laughs> I tend to want to fix a problem like as soon as I see it or as soon as I hear about it, I just want that quick fix. But we got to be patient. We got to be willing to just look, investigate, and not jump too quickly into that solution space. If we you know try to fix that problem without first understanding the system and those variables, then we're bringing our own biases into that solution. So how we think it should work or how, how it should work, not work, rather than actually what might work or might not work. So back to this Grand Challenges story here. So rather than trying to shoehorn this initiative into a conventional problem-solving framework, I started to learn all that I could about these Grand Challenges. And this really involved uh, primarily interviewing people that were engaged in that work. So we're talking about faculty members, uh, community leaders like county mayors, chamber organizations, workforce specialists, economic development specialists, folks like that. And so back to this guy for just a second. Using what you jotted down earlier, the project that left you feeling a little frozen, can you just take a few seconds and think of some people you could interview or maybe even just have a conversation with uh, to help you get a better understanding and bring in more perspectives to your situation? And just maybe write down a few names that come to mind. We'll just take a few brief seconds here for y'all to do that while I get some water. Okay. All right. Let's keep rolling. So as I was conducting these interviews, <clears throat> I started mapping these problems. So deconstructing these large scale challenges into smaller chunks and then plotting their components and parts and looking at the relationship between the parts and the different issues. And one of the purposes of mapping is about allowing you and other viewers to really see and explore, investigate that topic. And I feel like it just opens the door for some fresh thinking on anything you're looking at. 
And I love this quote from Carissa Carter at Stanford. Maps give us a chance to examine information in multiple ways, allowing us to focus on different aspects of a thing and reveal those things to the viewer. <clears throat> and so this brings us to our, our third key principle for today, mapping. <laughs> mapping just really helps give you that clarity, enhances your thinking about any topic that you're investi investigating, uh, helps you communicate about it. And when you can share your map with others, you give them a chance to give you insights about the topic and their perspective. It's an opportunity to make sure that you and your audience are operating on the same page, that you're seeing and understanding things in a similar way. And so I think probably most of you know this, but your system maps, system thinking maps are going to visually depict those relationships, networks, parts and holes, distinctions, and all those varying perspectives. So. With each new interview, I gained new knowledge and uncovered connections among these different problems that I didn't even know existed, like limited access rural communities have to mental health care and how that can perpetuate addiction. And so we've got this major problem in addiction in these geographic areas that lack a powerful resource to help them overcome that. And so if you think about mapping as a continuum of gaining knowledge, I started out somewhere slightly beyond no clue, uh, but it really, it didn't take long uh, in, in a few interviews to really develop a robust map and get really an information rich map and understanding of the grand challenges in a way that, that they hadn't been before. And so it was just this incredible, helpful uh, resource for me. Being able to zoom in and see specific parts and zooming out to see larger connections and impact uh, was just, in, invaluable. This is a high level view of an early stage map that you're looking at here. <clears throat> and again, this was built from taking in all those various perspectives of all the folks I interviewed, and it's continued to evolve, you know, as this project has progressed. But early on, it, it became clear that these big challenges couldn't be viewed any sort of linear or reductionistic way. They're not like dominoes, right? Nothing just happens in one place. They're more like webs things changing and acting on other things across many places, a tangle of variables and related issues of problems. And so the map really helped communicate this idea by visually demonstrating the complexity that we're dealing with. <clears throat> and something else that this map helped me understand was the idea that underneath all this complexity is simplicity, right? So when you zoom in and you consider individuals and their behaviors at that micro level, you can start to see how those behaviors and patterns, if repeated by many individuals, lead to those bigger outcomes at, or the mic macro level. So as, as Dr. Laura likes to say, the, the micro leads to the macro, right? And let me just give you a, an example of that. So imagine a child struggling in school might be the result of a difficult home life with a parent who has an addiction problem, which could be the outcome of an unnecessary prescription or maybe one bad choice. And now that parent can't pass a drug test. And so they're without a job along with hundreds of others. And this problem spreads. So companies can't find enough people to fill jobs and they end up leaving the county. So tax revenues drop followed by school funding and one issue just compounds another. And these difficulties morph and impact lives that you know, one time seem far removed from all this. So I think you could eventually see these micro behaviors contributing to the macro without mapping, but I think it's just going to take you so much longer to get there, especially with a topic that's so dense and so complex. And the maps really help us expose our own assumptions about how we think things should work, especially when we share them with others. So this is a, a simplified uh, version of my research map that I created and would share with others each time I did any sort of talk. And then here is a little bit more, uh, a version with a little more detail to it. So I use this map and presentations again to demonstrate the need for collaboration across all these disciplines and silos, because that's the only way we're going to bring meaningful steps towards changing or turning these issues around by involving multiple perspectives, experts, and experience, really collaborating around these things. And so with this Grand Challenge Initiative, we're still trying to get a clear idea of what this is before we can definitively say what the priorities should be. But having this larger global perspective, this 
mapping and then seeing all these things laid out helps us think about who we need to involve and then helps them see more clearly where they can get involved. And so systems thinking has really changed how I do a lot of things. And honestly, it's probably changed how I do everything, <laughs> especially work-related. Uh, you know, from helping colleagues map stakeholder relationships to assisting an organization figure out who they are and what they do, to coaching my boys' soccer team and helping them understand how their individual behaviors impact team performance. System thinking, it really is kind of a superpower if you think about it. And so I just want to close by repeating the principles that we've covered today to help you move past those now what questions on your next assignment. <clears throat> So again, relationships need structure, some kind of intentional accountability in order to function or work. A relationship can be a designated business unit or an individual or something less tangible like a performance metric. And you need to explore, investigate, and understand your problem before jumping in and trying to solve it, right? You need to look under that hood, see what the variables are that are contributing to the problem, really study that system, and then start mapping. It'll enhance your clarity about your topic, enhance your thinking, uh, and then share your map to get feedback and get everyone operating off the same understanding of how things work. Um, those, I think those things are just going to be incredibly invaluable for any time you find yourself stuck on a project. And let's see, I guess I'll stop my share and that's it. That was great, John. Thank you so much. Thanks. The, the comments are all positive. I think people really appreciate, appreciate your uh, point of view and your willingness to share sort of the beginning parts of your project and your work, which I think a lot of people are curious about. So we have just under 10 minutes for a couple of questions, if you are willing and able. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is ask you to, it's kind of a two-part thing. One, I wanted you to talk about the value of just seeing structure to help gain a footing in what, what many people, will, what you call an ill-defined problem, but separate from mapping. So we're gonna talk about mapping separate. I'm just talking about literally starting to think about the structure of your mental model and your problem before you're mapping. Can you share a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I feel like it's been my experience that when you start out with one of those murky problems and you're not really sure which way to go, which way to go, if you just start looking at the, the topic through your DSRP lens, so defining those identities, chunking and then breaking down those chunks into parts, and then defining those relationships and adding in those various perspectives, uh, using those structural elements to that to deconstruct that problem really helps generate your thinking around it and helps you see things that you know otherwise I think would still remain hidden. And if I can just give you a brief example. Um, that goes along with this, I think, really well. So a few months ago, I helped a colleague who was just starting to build a communications plan for a grant program. Mm -hmm. And she had this long list of stakeholders that all needed communication touch points, but the different needs were not clearly defined. And so using DSRP and the questions that come along with that, uh, we took her stakeholder list. And I'm going to talk about mapping just for a touch. We did map. We mapped out uh, yeah. her stakeholders using questions like, what does the audience need to know? How are they connected to the program? What are the related parts of the audience? Just dissecting and breaking down each group, each stakeholder group, and the relationships to her program. So at the end of that whole process, we had this fantastic stakeholder audience map that not only helped her develop this robust communications plan, because it helped her think about this from a more holistic uh, point of view, but also it helped her gain a better understanding of her own program. So I really feel like being familiar with and using systems thinking structure can help you better understand any system and design any system uh, in a better way. Yeah, that's great. Well, and I don't know if you can see the comments, but people are really um, appreciating the use of a systems map. Um, and I'm wondering if you can take the the previous answer a step further and say, okay, first there's the idea of seeing the structure of your mental models, but then there's the next step of actually diagramming, mapping, concretizing that mental model in some version of a map, right? And and what are the benefits of that? The actual yeah. process. Great, great question. <laughs> great question. So 
just like in that example I just shared with the grant program, the mapping really boosted and clarified her thinking and my thinking and understanding of that program. Uh, and it's just, it's really amazing what happens when you get that information out of your head and out of a conventional format, like a list and map it. I think it just opens the door for you to look at whatever it is from so many different angles, seeing those relationships and opportunities that I don't think are very easy to see otherwise. Um, so mapping, again, I, I think I mentioned this in my talk, it helps expose those assumptions you may have about how something should work or should be. Uh, and I, I heard this quote recently, and I think it applies really well here. It says, reality won't bend to your internal whims. So mapping helps us expose those internal thinking, our own internal thinking to reality. And that process helps us refine that thinking, especially when we can co-create it or share it with others. So yeah, I, yeah ma mapping's invaluable. I think it goes hand in hand with the structure piece for me. Yeah. Well, um, I do see a quick question just specific to mapping and then I'll move to my next um, thing I wanted to, to ask about. Uh, someone is asking, have you ever considered placing weight values on the relationship lines to sort of mathematically depict, you know, the reality, uh -huh. those that are the more salient or not? Is that something you've thought about? I have not thought about that, but that's that's a really interesting idea. Maybe I should try that. And I can always, uh, you know, lean on Matt Chadzi for some advice on on how to like come up with them a better map. So, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I need to I need to write that down so I can think about doing that. Yeah, but, yeah. Whoever that was. For those of you in the audience who are not familiar, Matt Chatsy is our in-house expert on mapping and visualization. And he and I have an ongoing debate about curved versus straight lines that <laughs> let other people help uh, figure out the uh, the answer. Not that there's one right answer. I right. think if your mental model involves curved lines, then your map should have curved lines. If your mental model sees them as straight, they should be straight. We can all be right. We can all be right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, not to call you out, but I did. Um, so then the next thing I was I was thinking about in terms of your work, it seems like your trajectory was you first sort of structured these mental models for yourself. You took that the next step of mapping them out for yourself. And then it seems like there's a, maybe has there been an effect on it looked like from the evolution of your maps in your presentation. Um, have there been, has there been any effect on like how well or, or the way that you communicate? Because you're dealing with a lot of people in a lot of different places based on, you know, your work. You're talking to people all the time about these grand challenges. Does this sort of structural mapping help you with the communication about the project and getting people to understand how you're thinking about it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So kind of what you're alluding to earlier, when I first started this project, I, I tended to view these things in isolation, not really seeing that global picture and understanding those inner overlapping parts and connectivity there. Um, so it completely expanded my, my view and my understanding of how it really is in the real world. Um, and so one thing that's, that's really neat about this is when we were launching this initiative, I had the opportunity to write a feature article for our, our system-wide alumni publication, and I used everything I'd picked up from systems thinking to help communicate that interconnectivity of those challenges. And for me, that communicating that interconnectivity helps humanize those big problems, right? Mm -hmm. If we just think about, you know, overcoming addiction, like that's a monumental colossal problem. But when we start to break it down to those, you know, connecting the dots to, to the, to the agents at that micro level. So, school age children and how that is connected to economically dis distressed counties like that, I think helps create this picture humanizes these problems in a way that people say, Oh my gosh, well, I really, I can do, I can actually have an effect on this in a positive way by getting involved in, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever it may be. So yeah, it's, it's completely helped how I communicate about all these things. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so listen, I'm going to thank you for a fantastic talk. I'm also going to remind people, as I said in my introduction, that John Lacey is one of the nicest, most generous humans you'll meet. So if you have more questions for him, I'm sure he would love to hear from you. So thank you, John. I appreciate your time. Thanks, I, thanks so much.